Today I want to show you how I've been working to earthquake retrofit my home using these retrofitting foundation plates, post caps like these, and framing angles up in the corners. Hey, I'm Dan and my mom and I bought some land out in the countryside to build a house. And to help with that, we thought we should have a trailer. So why not renovate a 1949 Spartan Manor? So if you want to see how these go, plus some other random DIY stuff, subscribe and follow along. I live in Tacoma, Washington, and ever since middle school, I've been hearing that this area is due for a major earthquake. So when I bought my home here seven years ago, I was pretty concerned about what damage it could do to it. So in this video, I'll talk about earthquake retrofitting and what I've done so far to help protect this two-story raised foundation house from the damages that could occur. This house was built in 1907, and apparently it wasn't common practice until 1985 for homes to actually have all the framing bolted to the foundation. So this means that everything above me, the two floors of my home, are only sitting on the foundation by friction and gravity alone. So if a big enough earthquake comes along, it could simply slide off. Of course, there are different types of foundations that homes can be built on. One is the slab foundation, which as it sounds, is just a giant slab of concrete on the ground. I'm not covering that because my house is built on a raised foundation. Raised foundation homes typically have a crawl space or a basement underneath. So how do you know if the framing of your house is attached to the foundation? First, you can look at the year it was built, but you can also go down into your basement or your crawl space and feel on these. These are called the mud sills that sit directly atop the foundation and feel or look for any threaded rod and nuts or bolts holding it down. Obviously, if you don't find any, then your home is not secure to the foundation. So I first called around to a few earthquake retrofitting companies to see if they could do my house. The three I contacted said they didn't do individual residential homes like this. And one of them just told me to go to the Simpson Strong Tie website and download the earthquake retrofitting guide and then do it myself. So that's what I'm doing. So there are two types of foundation plates. The first is the flat retrofit foundation plate, which you can also see up here. I was able to use these on much of my basement because the mud sill was pretty flush with the foundation. And I also preferred how these were flat against the wall compared to the next type. The second type of plate is the universal retrofit foundation plate. This is nice because it can accommodate for the mud sill sitting further back on top of the foundation, and even if the foundation has a bit of a slope on it. The other nice thing about these is that the five bolts to help secure it to the mud sill come along with it. And if you happen to have more space between the mud sill and the flooring system, enough where you could actually put a drill and go down through the mud sill and the foundation, then you can put bolts directly through that and you don't need to use these plates at all. But since I couldn't do that, that's beyond the scope of this video and I'm not covering it. To figure out how many foundation plates you need, there is a little table in the guide. In my situation with a two-story home, I need to have one of these foundation plates within nine to 12 inches of every corner. And then they need to be spaced four feet on center between each one at most. Another thing you need to look for are any breaks in the mud sill. So if the mud sill is not a continuous piece of wood, you need to have foundation plates within three to 12 inches of that break. So here I'm measuring out the placement of each of these foundation plates. Here's one of the foundation plates, it's a big beefy chunk of metal. And here I'm holding it up and I can see that there is a ridge of concrete that is keeping it further away. So I'm just using this hammer to knock those down. That's made things better, but there's still a gap. And so now I'm gonna measure and find a piece of wood that can fit back there nicely. Now I'm drilling pilot holes into the mud sill. To connect the foundation plates to the mud sill, I use the three and a half inch screws as advised in the guide. Here's one of these stainless steel screws. I'm using my impact driver to get all of these started and then tightening them down a bit more. And here you can see there's not quite enough wood back here and I'll fix that later. This is the rotary hammer, and this will make your life so much easier when you're drilling into the concrete of your foundation. I first started off using a hammer drill, not knowing that there was a very big difference, and it took me ages to drill every single hole for these foundation plates. And with one of these, I could drill a hole in about 30 seconds. This rotary hammer, at least, comes with the SDS Plus style of bits and chuck. And you can see here, it's quite a bit different than a regular drill bit. This rotary hammer did cost $270 plus tax. 
I think it's well worth it though, because contractors told me that they charge $200 per plate. I did check with Home Depot and they do rent these out for $40 a day. So if you already had all your plates screwed into the mud sills, you could easily rent one and go through all your holes in a single day. Now I'm using the foundation plate as a template to start drilling the holes for the big bolts. Now I'm shimming up the top of the plate to make sure that it doesn't stick up off the foundation and securing it once again. Now that's nice and flat. And to connect the foundation plates to the foundation, I use these four inch by half inch bolts as advised in the guide. I'm starting these off by hand. I really recommend wearing gloves at this stage because it's so easy to rub your knuckles against the rough foundation wall. This is a three quarter inch combination spanner I'm using to tighten. And you can see it takes a lot of force. At this point, I couldn't move any further. So I just backed it off a quarter turn and started again and took a little tumble. With a lot of effort, I was able to tighten this one down. To keep it neat, I'm just cutting off the tops of the shims. And that's one foundation plate installed. Of course, for the universal plates, the process is pretty much the same. Secure it with the five bolts that come with it, and then use it as a template to drill the holes with your rotary hammer. Then screw it in the foundation bolts, and there's one done. So this is a lot of work. A three quarter inch combination wrench probably isn't the best one. A ratchet might be easier. And I was using the box as a pillow. If you do have more room, you can use something like this breaker bar with a three quarter inch socket. For most of the holes drilled into the foundation, I was able to use this six inch bit, but in some places like this, where the pipe gets in the way of me reaching with the tool, I did buy this 12 inch bit so that I could still make a four and a quarter inch deep hole. And because the drill bit is so long, I've put a piece of tape at four and a quarter inches to make sure I go to the right depth. Sometimes I had to use a couple driver extenders to reach the screws for the mud sill. Having used both the flat and the universal foundation plates, I can say that these are a bit easier because you don't have to worry about shimming them if the mud sill is sitting further back on the foundation. The reason I went with these for a large part of my basement is again, the mud sill was pretty flush with the foundation. And I also just preferred these aesthetically. You know, I didn't want a whole bunch of plates sticking out of the wall like this. Your home may also have beams and posts that need to be secured together. Beams are these large horizontal pieces of wood that help hold up your floor system. And posts are the vertical ones that help support the beams. Before I started doing this earthquake retrofitting, this was not here. So it's simply this beam sitting on this post by gravity alone. Posts of course come in a variety of sizes. So these brackets go from three and a half inches up to six inches in width. To secure these brackets to the wood, you can use these number 10 by two and a half inch Simpson strong tie screws. Here I'm pounding down some nail heads to make sure that the bracket will fit smoothly against the post and the beam. Here's the bracket and here are the screws. So I'm securing it to the beam first because there is a bit of a gap between the beam and the post on this side. And I'm just filling that with a piece of plywood and securing it with the screws. This bracket does have triangular holes as well. And from what I understand, that's if you're gonna be nailing it, but I'm using screws. So this side next to my chimney was quite tight. So I had to use the right angle adapter and that's one plate in well. On the other side, I had a lot of cabling to deal with. So I used one of these pipe clamps to help hold them neatly above. Again, pounding down any nail heads. On this side, the post and the beam are a lot more flush. So I'm just able to drive in the screws without fitting any extra pieces of wood. And that's how you put a post cap on. The earthquake retrofitting guide also calls for reinforcing the connection between the flooring system and the mud sills using these A35 framing angles. The on-center spacing of these is also determined by how many floors your house has. So for this two-story house, these need to be every 32 inches at least. I'm just doing them between every pair of joists. Each one of these framing angles is secured by 12 of these number nine by one and a half inch screws. Because I don't have much room up here to drive screws down vertically into the mud sill, I'm having to use one of these right angle driver adapters. I'm putting one of these between each pair of joists and I can drive the horizontal screws okay. But again, I have to use the right angle adapter to drive the screws vertically. Here's one in place with 12 screws and here are two where there's a joint in the mud sill. In my house, the floor system or all these joists that hold up the floor 
are in direct contact with the mud sill here. And so that means that I have no cripple wall. So in some houses between this mud sill and the bottom of the floor system, there may be a short section of wall called the cripple wall. So if you do have a cripple wall, the Simpson Strong Tie Earthquake Retrofitting Guide has some additional steps that you need to take to help make sure that that cripple wall doesn't fail as well. And that's beyond the scope of this video because I didn't have to do it. So I hope this video has been helpful for you and good luck on your own project.